Threats are emerging daily with the motive of exploiting weaknesses in your network and software systems. With all of these vulnerabilities, threat actors today are specifically targeting unpatched systems and poor network designs. In this video, we sit down and speak with Josh Allen, our Chief Product Officer at PurpleSec, and ask him to share his insights on the threat landscape and the steps your organization can take to build a vulnerability management program. In this series, we're gonna discuss why a vulnerability management program is essential in 2022, the differences between SMB and enterprise vulnerability management programs, how to create a vulnerability management program with cloud environments in mind, some of the common pitfalls to avoid when implementing a program, and how automation helps to streamline this entire process. You won't want to miss this conversation. Josh, thanks for joining us here today. We're gonna to just jump right into it. Can you talk to us a little bit about what a vulnerability management program is? Yes, yeah, so a vulnerability management program is your series of people, processes, and tools that you're using to reduce the risk of your organization via vulnerabilities and the risk that they pose. Yeah, we've talked about you know assessments in the past, scans in the past as being a timestamp. Any time outside of that is an opportunity for more vulnerabilities to appear and, and put you at risk. What teams are typically included when you're developing this program so that people can actually get the right people on staff? In some way, it really includes somebody from every part of the organization. Primarily, though, you know, this is going to run through your information security and IT staff. So they need to be working together, the IT and IS staff. The information security staff will be setting up your goals for the security and the appetite for risk that the business environment has. The IT staff is there to support them in getting these things remediated. And then the rest of the organization is involved because when things do need to be remediated, it often involves software and systems that people are using in the business and they care about how and when those things get updated sometimes. Okay, excellent. And then when we're talking about vulnerability management, patch management is a big part of it as well. Can you explain what some of the differences are between the two? Again, it's it's patch management is a part of a vulnerability management program. So one step in remediating your vulnerabilities may be to patch software and systems, uh, but there is more to it than simply patching systems. So let's dive into the next part here, which is, you know, why is this something that organizations should be invested in? Why should we build out a program? Why should we go through all of these steps? Because any type of program development is going to be costly. It's going to be resource intensive. It's going to take time away from other projects. Well, to be honest, I think it's kind of right there in the name, right? Your vulnerability management, you're managing the vulnerability of your organization. And if you're not doing that, then... Well, you're vulnerable, aren't you? And vulnerable to what? Well, vulnerable to ransomware, vulnerable to all sorts of kinds of attack, uh, both on your inside and your external surfaces if you're a public company as well. Okay. And are there any requirements for vulnerability management? Well, one, you have to have a budget for it. <laughs> but if you if you don't already have a team in place, you know you need to go out and look for a service provider who can provide vulnerability management. It requires a set of tools to do effectively. You've got to be scanning. You've got to have an inventory. You need to have the tools that can manage updating and patching and, and developing solutions to these remediations in some kind of programmatic way, right? Rather than just emailing every user to update their system, you need to have some kind of policies in place to enforce that the vulnerability management program can follow. Right. And outside of those requirements of building the program, there are external factors that are requiring organizations to have some type of mature program. Is oh, that correct? Oh, sure. Compliance and regulatory requirements. I mean, if you're HIPAA, if you're NIST, if you're really anybody these days, you know, the U.S. federal government's CISA organization is starting to pump out policies at a pretty rapid rate. So we're going to see a lot more business requirements come along. So there's more standardization, more need to actually have a, a, a program in place, not just that assessment in time. Right. I mean, there's all the legal implications and then there's probably an update to the statistic, but I think last time we checked, cybercrime goes up in the hundreds of percentile, like six, 700% year over year. So you assume it's only going to get worse. <laughs> we assume it. <laughs> well, hopefully it's not. Uh, good job security, I guess. And one of the other finer points here that I think is worth mentioning is if you've accrued a backlog of vulnerabilities over the years, uh, a program is something that can, can help you out in that case. Is that right? 
Definitely. And you'll, you'll take a slightly different approach, but it's still really around prioritization of those remediations and coming at it from a risk-based perspective. Okay. Gotcha. Now, vulnerability management can take a few different forms here in terms of what the needs are for the organization. If you're a small business versus an enterprise, for example, your needs are going to be a little bit different. Can you speak a little bit to that? Certainly. So on the small business side, I mean, some of these businesses are small enough that they work entirely in the cloud. You know, they have a very small hardware footprint, you know, maybe they're BYOB. So when you're doing a vulnerability management program here, there's different considerations. You don't have full control over a big enterprise network, right? Where you have people as part of an active directory domain all the time necessarily. So what you need to do is you need to understand where your risks are and where you can assess your vulnerabilities. And then the way in which you approach them is going to differ if you're not managing all of the systems in your environment. Uh, Now on the flip side, as I mentioned, the enterprise has a lot more control. So typically with an enterprise, I wouldn't say it's easier, but there's a more definitive path to take because you can enforce updates. You can enforce things with group policy, right? You have change windows in all of your processes. And you mentioned cloud environments. Is there any nuance that we should be aware of when you're developing a program if you're more of a cloud-based organization? Yeah, I'd say it doesn't necessarily make things easier, but I do think it can allow for a smaller vulnerability footprint versus your traditional, you know, on-prem or even hybrid environment. When you're in the cloud, a lot of the platform stuff is taken care of for you on Azure and AWS. So really your vulnerability focus moves to just in how you've configured, set up your environment and what you're developing in that environment versus all the platforms they're running on. All right, understood. Let's jump into the meat of the conversation here. I'm an organization. I don't have any vulnerability management program in place. What are some of the steps that I should be taking to to get that program built out? First and foremost, you need an inventory. Got to know what you have, both system-wise and vulnerability-wise, an inventory of both, as well as all of your software. And that means you need to also understand, you know, who owns all the things, you know, just what's out there. You need to categorize everything. And then when it gets into the mitigation, what you're typically doing is you're finding what the solution is, creating some sort of solution package. You should be testing it in a test environment or a development environment beforehand, and then running through your change management process with approvals, you know, get that deployed out to your environment in a way that works for your business. And then you need to report on that, right? So you need to see what was out there, what is your plan for remediation, and what has been patched, right? Now, the first four are what I like to call the traditional way of doing it. And that's what, you know, we here at PurpleSec are aiming to speed up and kind of change with our way of providing services, which we can talk about a little bit later on, you know, how automation is really the future of vulnerability management. An organization goes through these steps, we're we're preparing all these things, but of course, You know, there's nothing like experience to to teach you some of the pitfalls that come about and some of the challenges of building these programs. What would you say are some of the top, let's say, three challenges that organizations face when trying to implement this type of program? For this one, there's quite a few of these listed on our website. And for anything we've talked about already, there's a lot more details there. I, I think that for me... My favorite, or I guess least favorite, top three. What I've seen cause the most trouble in implementing these programs or running them as a member of a blue team is um, number one, which I says the number one step is poorly managed asset inventory. It's unfortunately very common too, because it's not always the easiest thing to do, especially if you start when you are an enterprise versus when you only have a few, you know, 20 or so systems. That can lead to a very long runtime on getting an idea of your risk rating and if there's anything that needs to be mitigated that you can't do programmatically and you have to track down the owner of the system, like how, you know, you have to know who that is. And so if you don't have an inventory, it's going to make that a lot of pain for everybody involved. I think next is lack of security expertise, especially when, you know, we're being brought in. They're either smaller companies who haven't had to think about security yet. Or there are larger organizations who have just been having a really hard time with getting security under control. And in both those cases, the lack of a dedicated team of people with really good security expertise can be pretty tough on the vulnerability management program, right? Because it it requires not just understanding that, yes, here's a thing, and yes, I need to patch it, but 
if you're doing it from a risk-based perspective, you have to have somebody that both understands the business and understands, okay, what are the security implications of these vulnerabilities, right? But people's security expertise would tell you otherwise. And then finally, another really big, really common, and one with a lot of detrimental impact is lack of good project management or kind of leaving that as an afterthought, right? It's like, yeah, let's just jump in to start doing things. We've already got a process, right? Which works, but it starts to fail when you run into unpredictable circumstances, right? It's much like having a lack of security expertise. It's like once the process doesn't work, you need to have somebody who can manage timelines, right? Figure out who's going to resolve the issue, coordinate the teams, make sure people are communicating, right? Because it's going to start involving more people than just your IT and information security teams. And a project manager is really the best person to bring all those groups together in a coherent way that will make it run smoothly. Right. And as someone who has managed multiple projects on my end, and I'm sure it's similar on your end as well, there's always surprises that creep up. No matter what, no matter how much you prepare for it, no matter how much you plan, there's always surprises. There's always a wrench in the plan and you need to adapt to it. And so having project management and the security expertise at the core of it helps to streamline that entire process. Speaking on, on a point that you mentioned earlier about automation, you know, at PurpleSec, we like to talk about automation a lot, not to get rid of security jobs, but to empower and enable security professionals to do more in their role. So can you speak a little bit to how automation is changing how security professionals approach vulnerability management? Yes. So as I mentioned previously in the seven steps, some of our automation really compresses that down. So I think in the future, you know, you're probably, we're going to be talking about maybe four steps to a really good vulnerability management program if you've included automation. So the inventory management, categorization of vulnerabilities, those things are what automation really excel at. For a human, you're going out and you're just trying to go through Excel sheets and really tedious tasks like that, right? Like low skill, boring things that to be honest, if you look at it on a cost analysis, is a waste of time if you've got a security expert digging through Excel. I mean, you're paying them to look through Excel, right? Like they sh you should be paying them to do security stuff. So you let the automation do that, right? The automation is going to go out. It's going to check the network. It's going to talk with your security tools. It's going to speak with Tenable and everything else that you have out there to manage your endpoints. It's going to find what's actually out there, what version is it on, what software is running. And it's going to do it way faster than somebody can digging through Excel anyway. The same thing with categorization, you know, next, it usually takes a lot of research to go, okay, it's more than just a CVSS score, right? A lot of people like to just go, well, let's start with criticals. So the automation is also very good at taking in threat intelligence and all these other feeds that it has in its database. You know, our system's being updated by researchers and professionals hourly, right? So anytime something new comes out, it's being put into the system. It's getting to the system and being scanned faster than people can communicate it to each other. And then on the remediation side, you know, it can talk to all your endpoint management systems, queue everything up for you, right? And it can schedule it and prioritize it based on the settings that we or the client, you know, have put into the system. So you can still meet your needs quickly and you're not spending so much time on these tedious tasks. Now your security team's freed up to do more important security things, right? Like doing your internal auditing and doing your digital transformations, stuff like that. So really it just comes down to the change management process where you put the human in the system there to approve, to just make sure that, you know, what the automation is doing is not going to ruin anybody's day on the business side. And then you just let it do its thing and you get reports out of it. So it really compresses it down. It makes it faster. You get a quicker time to resolution and you get a better Rosie. Turn on security investment. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We like that acronym. <laughs> it's one of our favorite security acronyms. And you touched upon a really important point. Our systems are updated hourly. I mean, we can, in some cases, not all cases, report on zero day vulnerabilities to our clients and get like Log4j, for example, and get that remediated before it's even an issue, or at least get to the steps towards remediation because, you know, have a like plan that. as <laughs> soon as you have that meeting. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for the insight here, Josh. Uh, and I really hope that this is going to help folks out there when they're building their programs. Is there any other pearls of, of wisdom or knowledge that you want to impart to our audience before we close out here? Visit our website and give us a call. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank you so much, Josh.